I've been up here hiking in the mountains and taking pictures. It's just a beautiful day. The rhododendron are out, and it's just a great day to be alive. Today's video, we're going to be talking about Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? You know, there's a lot of different ideas about who Jesus is from many different religions, even in Christianity. But let's open the Bible and see what it has to say about who Jesus is. In today's study, we're going to start in the book of Matthew, chapter 16. And we're going to start out by reading verses 13 through 14. And coming into the parts of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say me to be, the Son of Man? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, today, in May of 2024, who do men say Jesus is? I'm sure you hear different many things depending on what religious background they come from. And even in Christianity, there's different thoughts about who Jesus is. But today... Let's concentrate on what the Bible has to say about who Jesus is. Continuing in Matthew 16, verse 15, He, being Jesus, said to them, But who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, You are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, Peter's response to Jesus about who do you say that I am, is that you are the Christ, meaning the anointed or the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And notice Jesus' response. He said, Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And furthermore, it's on this rock, on this foundational statement that you just made, that I am Christ, the Son of God, that I will build my church. Let's continue on looking at Matthew chapter 3. I'm going to be reading verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to John, John the Baptist, to be baptized by him. But John restrained him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? And answering, Jesus said to him, Allow it now, for it is becoming to us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. And Jesus, when he had been baptized, went up immediately out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, this is at the baptism of Jesus. And we see that the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And this voice of God from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So God is testifying that Jesus Christ is his Son, his beloved Son. In Mark 9, we have the account of the transfiguration, 
We're going to be reading verses 2 through 7. And after six days, Jesus took Peter and James and John and led them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothing became shining, exceedingly white as snow, such as no fuller on earth could whiten them. And Elijah with Moses was seen by them, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were very much afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Again, here we have this testimony of God, the Father of Christ, saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. So let me ask you a question. Do you think that God, who created everything through his Son, Jesus Christ, do you think he knows what a father is and what a son is and the relationship between them both? Or do you think he's lying here, he's not telling the truth, that Jesus is not my son, both at his baptism and here at the transfiguration? This is what First John 5 says. We're going to be reading verses 9 through 12. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified about his Son. He who believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he does not believe the record that God gave of his, his Son. And this is the record that God has given to us everlasting life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Is this pretty clear? That the witness of God is greater than the witness of men. And this is the witness of God, what he testified, testified about his son. That God has given us everlasting life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. The witness of men today say Jesus is not the Son of God, but he is God himself. Or if you're a Jew, you might say that Jesus was a good man, or maybe even dare to say he was a prophet. Or if you're a Muslim, you say Jesus was not the Son of God, but he was a prophet. Or any other variety of religions out there, they all deny that Jesus is the Son of God. But this is the witness of God, the Father of Jesus Christ, that this is my Son. And it's important that you understand this because he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Verse 10, He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he does not believe the record that God gave of his son. So let's see what Jesus' own personal testimony is about who he is. We're going to be reading John chapter 10, verses 24 through 36. Then the Jews encircled him and said to him, How long do you make us doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness on me. But you did not believe, because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Not anyone shall pluck them out of my hand. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. 
Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from my Father. For which of these do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, We do not stone you for a good work, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it it not written in your law? I said, You are gods? And if you call those gods with whom the word of God was, and the scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him, speaking of himself, Jesus, whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, you blaspheme, because I said, I am the Son of God? This is Jesus' own witness about himself. He never claimed to be God. He said, I am the Son of God. In verse 30, he said, I and the Father are one. He's talking about the work that they're doing together for the salvation of the world. John 10, verses 37 through 39. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and believe that the Father is me in me and I in him. They again seized, sought to seize him, but he went forth out of their hand. Jesus said, The Father is in me, and I in him. The Spirit of God is in him. Let's look at John 15. This is Jesus talking to us. He says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it remains in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Jesus' testimony on this earth was that he could do nothing of himself. He was totally dependent upon his Father. Thus he says, the Father is in me, and I in him. Jesus tells us the same thing about our relationship with him. He says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it remains in the vine. In verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. He is not denying his sonship because he says the Father is in me, and I in him. Because he wants that same relationship with you and me that we abide in Jesus and he in us. Luke chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 38 through 41. And rising up from the synagogue, he entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was being seized with a great fever, and they asked him for her. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. And the sun sinking, all as many as had sick ones with different kinds of diseases, brought them to him. And laying hands on each of them, he healed them. And also demons came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And rebuking them, he did not allow them to speak, for they knew him to be the Christ. So Jesus was visiting Simon Peter's home, and his wife's mother was sick, and he healed her, and the word got out. And so anyone that had sick ones with different kinds of diseases brought them to Jesus. And laying hands on each of them, he healed them. He also cast out many demons, but those demons, those followers of Satan, the evil angels that followed Satan, cried out, saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. See, they know who Jesus is. And they can't help but speak the truth in the presence of Christ. John three sixteen through 21. Most of you probably have read this text. Let's read through it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, Who is speaking here? This is Jesus speaking to Nicodemus that whosoever believes in him should not perish 
but have everlasting life. Verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who practices truth comes to the light, so that his works may be revealed, that they exist, having been worked in God. So what does Jesus say about his relationship with his Father and why he is here on this earth? He says in verse 16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. We all know what the word begotten means. We all have read the chapters in the Bible of so-and-so begot so-and-so and the lineage of different families here Jesus is saying he is the only begotten Son of God. And God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. God sent his Son. God had to have a Son to send in the world. Verse 18, He who believes on him, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Again, this is, these are Jesus' words, talking to Nicodemus. When Nicodemus came to him in the, in the night, trying to find out who he was and what salvation was all about. John chapter 11. John chapter 11 is the story or the account of Lazarus and his death and resurrection. Here in verse 23, Jesus is talking to Martha. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Notice what she's saying, her understanding of who Christ is. He's the Son of God, which should come into the world. According to John 3.16, God sent his Son in order to not condemn the world, but to save it. You have to have a Son to send in order to send one. Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him, Walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is the Spirit, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee unto the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, 
Wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. This is the experience the disciples had on this stormy night on the Sea of Galilee. And Peter especially, who was walking on the water, at least for a little ways, until he doubted. And when everything that occurred, they realized that Jesus, of a truth, is the Son of God. John 5, verses 19 through 25. Then Jesus answered and said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever thing he does, these also the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all the things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and makes alive even so the Son of Man makes alive whomever he wills. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son, so that all should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Again, is that clear about this father-son relationship here? Continuing on in verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into, into condemnation, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they who hear shall live. Again, who does Jesus say he is? He's the Son of God. John 6, verses 60 through 69. This chapter 6 is where Jesus is talking about being the bread of life. And he goes on to say, this is the bread that has come down from heaven. If you eat of it, you will not die. He tells them to, to, that his flesh that he's giving is, is this bread and that we need to eat of it. And the same of his blood, we need to drink of it. And after this conversation with the Jews, in verse 60, it says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmur, murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? He had told them that he had come down from heaven. If that offended them, what would they say if they see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quicketh, and the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Verse 64. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore say it unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the testimony of the disciples, that Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Matthew 8, verses 28 through 32. And when he had come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? 
And there was a good way off from them a herd of many swine feeding. And the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, allow us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. And when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. So these two demon-possessed men met Jesus. And what did the demons say? Verse 29. What have we to do with you, Jesus, Son of God? Who do the de demons believe that Jesus is? They believe he's the Son of God. 1 John 4, verses 7 through 15. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love has not known God, for God is love. In this the love of God was revealed in us, because God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation concerning our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. So what is John talking about here? He says, in this the love of God was revealed to us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That he sent his son to be a propitiation concerning our sins or a substitute for us concerning our sins. Is it clear what John believed? That Jesus is the only begotten son of God? Notice verse 13. By this we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us a, of his spirit. We know from reading the Bible that no one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. So unless you have the Son of God, you can't receive the Spirit of God. Daniel chapter 3, verses 20 through 26. And he commanded the most money men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. If you're not familiar with this story, this is the story of some Israel has been invaded and then many have been brought prisoners to Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar has set up this statue and has commanded everyone at the sound of the music to bow down and worship this statue. These three men have refused to do that. So they are going to be casting them into the burning fiery furnace. Verse 21. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen and their hats, and their undergarments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because of the king's command was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flames of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. So the men of the king's army that threw them into the fiery furnace died because the furnace was so hot, just in the process of throwing them into the furnace. Verse 24. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loosed, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the, fourth, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. 
Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. This account, this story, is many years before Jesus Christ came to this earth. Yet he is still called the Son of God. It was Jesus that was walking in the midst of the fire with these three Hebrew boys who kept them from being hurt by the fire when that same, very same fire killed the men that had thrown them in there. Matthew 27, verses 50 through 54. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. This is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion, and they that were with him, Watching Jesus, saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. So here we have men who participated in putting Jesus Christ to death, recognizing and exclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God. Acts chapter 9, verses 19 through 20. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Apostle Paul. Before he was named Paul, he was called Saul and was a persecutor of God's church. And on the road to Damascus, um, he had this bright light shone upon him where Jesus um, talked with him and he was converted. And this is right after this in verse 19 of Acts 9. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which call on the, this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. So Saul, who had come to Damascus to try to um, find those of the way, or those that followed Jesus, and put them in prison, and maybe putting some to death, he was converted on the road to Damascus. And this man who fought against the gospel of Jesus Christ now is claiming that Jesus is the Son of God. 1 John 3, verses 1 through 10. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin, speaking of Jesus Christ. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, nor know him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that do, doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither is 
he that loveth not his brother. So we see here in verse 8, this issue of sin, sin is the transgression of God's law, plainly speaking, just being disobedient to God. And it was for this purpose that the Son of God was manifested, revealed that he might destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 5, 1 through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves him who begets also loves him who has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, whenever we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everything that has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is our high priest in the, in the sanctuary in heaven, and he is also the Son of God. And because he was tempted in all points just as we are, and yet without sin, he's able to help us in our time of need. Galatians 2.20 This is Paul speaking. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Again, who does Paul say Jesus is? He's the Son of God. And he also talks about the faith of the Son of God. It was because of the faith of Jesus while he was on this earth, his faith in his Father, who did the will of his Father. He put his trust in God, his Father. And that's how he overcame sin in this world. Hebrews 10, verses 26 through 29. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose you, shall he be thought worthy who had trodden under the foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 15. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. This is talking about the gifts that Christ gave to men once he returned to heaven. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, that we might grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So what is Paul saying? 
that we should all come into the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we shouldn't be deceived by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Do you believe the testimony of men? Or do you believe the testimony of God and his Son and his followers? Matthew 4. Now I realize there's an alternative narrative in the Bible about who Jesus is. And we're going to look at this here in Matthew chapter 4. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taking him up into the holy city, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dast thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. We'll continue this in a minute. What is Satan saying to Jesus here? He says, if thou be the Son of God. Satan and his children and his followers say these words. They're casting doubt on the sonship of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Continuing in verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up unto exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give you, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Not only is Satan put into the minds of men and into the mind of Christ himself to question his sonship. But he also wants Jesus to worship him. For what Satan desires most is that he be worshipped as God and his son are worshipped. Matthew 26, 60 through 66. But Jesus held his peace. This is during the trial in the Sanhedrin before Jesus' crucifixion. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the, son, the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said it. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Here the high priest is asking that Jesus tell him whether if he's the Christ, the Son of God, or not. And Jesus responds in the affirmative, Thou hast said it. And because he has spoken this, they consider it blasphemy and say that he is guilty of death. Matthew 27, verses 35 through 44. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that they, it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them. And upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it 
in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him, with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, and himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. John eight thirty nine through 45 They answered and said unto him, These are the religious leaders. Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father, Then say they to him, We be not born of fornication, we have one Father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. So what's Jesus saying? He's talking to the Jewish religious leaders. He said, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. He's the Son of God. And here he says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. What did Satan tell Jesus during his time in the wilderness when he was tempting him? If you are the Son of God. Why was Jesus put to death in the trial of the Sanhedrin? Because he said he was the Son of God. What did people mock him of when he was on the cross? If you are the Son of God, come down off the cross and we will believe you. John 20, verses 30 through 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing ye might have life through his name. So who do you believe? Do you believe what men tell you about who Jesus is? Or do you believe the witness that's found in God's word? Those that are of God will speak the words of God. Those that follow Satan will speak his words. May God continue to bless you as you study his word.